commitment I made for Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders became an instant internet sensation after the 2021 inauguration of Joe Biden. My life, as I knew it, blew up. <laughs> Thousands of people reached out to me asking for the mittens. Pe reporters from all over the world emailed me and called me. Everyone suddenly wanted something from me. It was so stressful. Meanwhile, I was teaching second grade in a small rural school in northern Vermont, and my report cards were due on Friday. <laughs> and at home, my five-year-old daughter needed her mom, and my, my partner needed her spouse, and our dog needed walks. <laughs> but somewhere in all that frenzy, I felt that there must be some opportunity Nothing that outrageous had ever happened to me before. And even though my life was calling to me to just live it and be happy, I couldn't ignore the fact that I had somehow found myself at the center of the funniest moment in recent history. <laughs> I don't know exactly what it was that made the Bernie meme so funny and so universally appealing. But I do know that our world was hurting. Millions of people had already died from the Corona-19 virus. The United States Capitol had been attacked just two weeks before by a pro-Trump mob, and five more people had needlessly died. Our country was so bitterly divided. It was a time of uncertainty and grief. The picture of Bernie and all the subsequent memes gave us all a massive joke. It was humor that transcended religious, political, and national boundaries. If you couldn't agree with your neighbor on anything else, you could at least agree that Bernie sitting with the mean girls was <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> so I gave an interview. And then I gave another interview. And then I wrote my report cards. And then I gave another interview, and I wrote more report cards. And I tucked our daughter into bed, and then I went on MSNBC. <laughs> it was surreal. I gave an interview with Ari Shapiro, who I have a massive crush on, <laughs> from my classroom computer during my lunch break at school. All of this humor was... <laughs> an incredible source of energy that came to me in two waves. First, people wanted the mittens. And they didn't just want one pair of mittens. 22,000 people reached out to me asking for mittens for everyone they knew. Store owners wanted to fill their stores with mittens. Families wanted to buy them for, for the holidays. Someone found a Twitter post of mine from a year before that said I had some mittens for sale, <laughs> and suddenly the desire for the mittens went through the roof. People were emailing me and calling me, saying, I'll take number 31. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I explained to people that I didn't have any mittens for sale. I only made mittens for holiday craft fairs, and because of the pandemic, we didn't have any holiday craft fairs, so I hadn't made any mittens. The second wave was a tsunami <laughs> of people pushing me to monetize the moment. People suggested I open a cottage industry in my living room, open a factory, make a waiting list for the mittens, and charge a thousand dollars a piece. No one should spend a thousand dollars on mittens, by the way, unless it's for charity. <laughs> And, and these comments and suggestions often came with, with little side notes like, you'd be a fool to let this opportunity pass you by. And I didn't want to be a fool. In those moments after the inauguration, what I really wanted was to be at home with my family. I wanted to play games with our daughter and, and do crafts with her, and cook dinner with my wife, and cuddle on the couch with my dog and watch trashy reality TV. <laughs> I wanted to keep living my life as it was. 
But there was a voice inside me. (laughs) It was the voice of predicting regret. Does anybody else have that voice? (laughs) It's, my wife calls it pregret. It's the voice that tells you to do something you're not sure you want to do because you're afraid that if you don't do it, you'll regret not doing it later. Pregret is a very specific kind of FOMO. I considered all the possibilities. I sought out advice from our accountant, a lawyer, friends who owned businesses, my wife. I asked myself, what piece of this experience can I accept without changing the quality of my life and without giving up who I am? And then I began to ask myself, do I really love all of my life? So many of the interviews I gave after the inauguration seemed to center on the fact that I was a teacher. It seemed really important to everybody that I was the Vermont teacher who made Bernie Sanders mittens. There was a narrative that I was like the lovely Miss Beetle from Little House on the Prairie, except I was living in a farmhouse in Vermont. We don't live in a farmhouse. And I was teaching the youth of America by day while knitting mittens for politicians at night. (laughs) I knew that was not my life, but it did seem very picturesque to imagine it that way. (laughs) In reality, I was like so many teachers in America right now. I was burnt out. I loved teaching once upon a time, but that time had long since passed. People love to love a beloved teacher. And it's nice to be that teacher who is so loved. But amidst all that fanfare around the lovely teacher who made Bernie's mittens was actually a teacher who was looking for something else. The year we came back to school after the pandemic had closed our schools the previous spring, administrators loosened the vice grip they have on teachers and we were allowed to be creative. I built an outdoor classroom in the woods behind my school. It was a magical place. That whole year was an inventive and creative professional one for me. It was the best year I'd had in over a decade. I had hope that the pandemic unraveling of school as we knew it would lead to some much needed changes in the way we educate children. But the following year, 2021, things went right back to the way they had been before. Circumstances beyond my control forced me to return to my inside classroom, and my students were right back at the desks they had been at before the pandemic began. We could see the outdoor classroom from our classroom window, but we couldn't get there. As much as I wanted my school life to change, I had to operate within a system that I believed was failing a lot of children. My teaching was once a thing of such beauty, but it was no longer bringing me joy. And I lost hope that things would ever get better and stay better. I didn't know what I would be if I was no longer a teacher. For 17 years, teaching had been more than my career. It was part of my identity. And by the end, it was not the profession it was when I started. And I was not the naive and hopeful 22-year-old I was when I started either. And then the inauguration happened, and I was weirdly internet famous, and the world held up a mirror for me to take a very good look at my life. Meanwhile, there was a true sadness brewing inside me. Making mittens and selling them at holiday craft fairs was so fun. It was a thing that I did that brought me peace and connected me with my community. And it was some extra cash that allowed our family to go on a nice vacation every summer. I felt that if I went to a craft fair now and sold my mittens for $30, as I always had, that someone would take advantage of the situation and buy them all and sell them for a lot more online. People were already impersonating me, using my name and likeness, pretending to open online businesses. 
The Vermont Attorney General's office had reached out to me asking for my help in prosecuting these individuals who are no doubt going to rip a lot of people off. The dark underbelly of the internet was showing itself to me in all its sinister glory. I didn't ask for any of that. All I had done was craft a pair of mittens for my favorite senator to thank him for supporting gay rights five years before the inauguration even happened. And through a weird twist of events, somehow they ended up on the national stage. I didn't know how to handle that kind of fame or attention. Sometimes your future arrives when you are stuck in your present and opportunities are total surprises. Sudden internet fame presented me with a lot of opportunities, most of which I didn't want. I kept telling myself, just because an opportunity presents itself doesn't mean you have to take it. But then my pregret would return, and I would browbeat myself for letting something great pass me by. I needed to make some decisions. I needed to get out of my own way. I needed to be creative. So I sat down at my sewing machine and I sewed some mittens. <laughs> when I think back on it now, I can't help but see the interesting parallel of that dilemma and the craft that brought me there in the first place. So many people thought I knit those mittens for Bernie Sanders, but guess what? I don't knit. I don't even know how to knit. I learned how once and I forgot. What I do is repurpose. I take old sweaters that have been discarded, that often have moth holes or mouse poop or they've been shrunk, and I cut them into shapes and sew them back together as mittens. The cuffs of the sweaters become the cuffs of the mittens. I upcycle them. When I sit down at my sewing machine, my whole body relaxes. My mind processes conversations and events and feelings that have lingered sometimes for years. Creativity releases serotonin in your brain. And I feel it when I'm rolling on a project and I get started in the morning and I look up and hours have passed and the sun is setting and everything else has disappeared. Crafters call that kind of focus being in the creative flow. And at the end, there's a thing of beauty. Sewing was how I got myself into that mess, and sewing was how I was going to figure out how to get out of it. You know, that sweater that I used to make Bernie's mittens was once a janky, discarded, moth-eaten sweater full of holes covered in mouse poop that one of my students' grandmothers knit, and she left it on my desk thinking maybe I could use it. And when I first saw it, I thought, that is the ugliest sweater I've ever seen, <laughs> and I will never use it. But I wanted to be polite, so I took it home, and then it ended up in the bottom of my closet. And I remember the day that I had the idea to make the mittens for Bernie. I thought, well, he has a brown coat, and I think I have a really old brown sweater somewhere. <laughs> so I went digging around in my closet, and I found it. And it took me a really long time to figure out how to use it in the best way. But I cut around it, cut around all the bad parts, and I saved the best parts for Bernie. Ultimately, that's what I needed to do with my life, too. I needed to cut out the parts that were no longer things of beauty. I needed to do that for myself and for my family. I survived the media circus by being creative. I didn't open a mitten factory, but I did partner with the Vermont Teddy Bear Factory. They had all the infrastructure to make and sell the mittens. They had the sewing machines, the sales and shipping departments, the personnel and marketing capabilities. They created a new arm of their business and called it the Vermont Mitten Company with me as a consultant. They also created 10 new jobs with benefits, most of which went to new Americans. Now, I have been very careful not to be prideful about the fame that I experienced because of the mittens, but I am so proud of those jobs. 
I also continue to make mittens, but mostly I just make them for charities. My charitable mitten making donations in conjunction with the donations from Vermont Teddy Bear have totaled over $400,000. And the Bernie campaign, after the inauguration, made a sweatshirt with his picture and his grumpy face and mittens on it that made $1.8 million. So a lot of financial good has come from the mitten frenzy. Making mittens was a hobby that brought me joy, but that joy would have been crushed if it became my career. The process of redesigning your life is so similar to the process of repurposing a sweater. You have to decide what you want to keep, but there is an element of what you have to keep. And there are not endless possibilities for what you can do with your life when you're an adult just like there aren't endless possibilities of what you can do with an old sweater. I mean, you can't take an old sweater and turn it into a car. <laughs> and you can't give up a job that gives you health insurance and puts food on your table and pays your rent or mortgage. I also want to acknowledge that I stand before you as an able-bodied, educated white woman in America. I have so much privilege. And I did make some money from the internet sensation. And so I resigned from my teaching career 18 months ago. It was a heartbreaking decision, but it was time. I took stock of my life and I realized that was the piece that had to go. When I asked my wife about leaving teaching and starting something else, she was like, Everyone deserves a second act in life. So I gathered up all of those stories from that wild experience of being internet famous, and I wrote a book. It's called Bernie's Mitten Maker. It's a memoir, and in it, I talk about how creativity and crafting ultimately got me through all of the most difficult parts of my life. Last year, I completed my first year of a master's program in counseling at the University of Vermont. In a few years, I do hope to open a private therapy practice. Becoming famous as Bernie's mitten maker was a surprise that I didn't know how to manage. At every turn, I just did the next right thing. Yes, I just quoted Anna from Frozen 2. <laughs> I made the best decisions I could make in the moment with what I knew at the time. And in the end, 10 people get up every day and go to jobs that didn't exist before. And Outright Vermont added a second week to their summer program, their summer camp program that serves LGBTQ youth. And I wrote a book that sometimes hits the bestseller list of my local independent bookstore, <laughs> mostly because my friends are buying it. <laughs> and I doubled down on loving the life I already had. I'm home at night to tuck our daughter in to bed and to spend time with my wife and our dog. I treated my life as I would treat a beloved sweater. I took out some of the parts that were no longer working for me, and I kept the intricate and beautiful designs. I cut it up, and I sewed it back together. I remembered that there is never a lack of opportunity to regroup and rebuild. I took my life and I repurposed it. I upcycled it. And I gave myself a second act. Thank you.